Hey there, Whitefield. Good to be uh, with you this morning. I just wanted to tell you a couple of things. I want to thank you for, for joining us again online this week. Uh, I know that normally we would, we would be meeting together, but this is the season that God has got us in right now. And so we're just going to trust him through, through all of this and, and use this special, unique time uh, for his glory and for our good. Uh, as we walk through this season together uh, as a church, the leadership here at Whitefield will, will continue to update you. So, so check social media. Uh, check uh, uh, your church well, as we send out a church-wide email, and also you can you can check any updates uh, through the link that's at the top of the screen. Now let's go let's go worship and let's hear the word of God taught. God bless you, church. Good morning, Whitefield family. Happy Easter to you all. Let's sing praises together this morning. See 
Father God, thank you so much for another beautiful day to you've given us, Father. Thank you for your son dying on the cross and rising again to save us from our sins, Father. God, ask you to bless Pastor Mike as he brings the message, Father. May it give you honor and glory and praise. We love you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Good morning, Whitefield, and happy Easter to everyone out there. It is Resurrection Sunday, and it is so good to be with you. I hope all of you are doing well, and I know that this is uh, the most unusual Easter Sunday that we've ever had uh, together. Um, but church, the, the tomb is still empty. Jesus continues to live and will live forever, and so we have cause for joy. So I hope that you are joyful out there. Uh, this morning, and we are so glad that you are with us. Now, I know that for most of us, this might be the worst Easter outfit that we've ever worn. I mean, this is, uh, I see a lot of folks out there wearing pajamas uh, this morning, and, uh, and good on you. You know, this, you don't ever have this opportunity to wear pajamas on an Easter Sunday, so, so, so have at it. There's, there's, there's probably some of you out there that haven't dressed up in weeks in weeks, and so uh, enjoy this time. And uh, uh, but, but folks, may this be the the first and last Easter we spend in our living rooms. Can I get an amen out there? Thank you, um, church. I am I'm so thankful to be with you. I'm so thankful for our, our praise team. I think so thankful for the the time of worship uh, that we just. Uh, got to enjoy. Uh, we are, we're blessed by our gifted singers and our gifted musicians. I'm so thankful for Brian and Ben and Renee and Emily, uh, how they have just uh, risen to the challenge during this season. I'm so thankful for Jonathan, for Corey, for Andy, how they uh, just have worked so hard to to present what, what you see this morning, um, how they have, have just recorded and, and, and captured the audio and the graphics and, and all. It's just, it's just been a, a stellar job by, by all of them. And I'm just thankful for, for the team that we have here at Whitefield. And, and I'm thankful for you, church. I'm thankful for you guys, for your faithfulness. I know so many of you have reached out uh, by text message or call or visit or email, just encouraging myself and our staff here at, at Whitefield. And for that, we're grateful and we are thankful uh, for that. And, and we miss you and we long to be with you. And we know that, that one day soon we will all be together. And I look forward to that day. Well, if you will, I'll, I'll ask you to grab a copy of God's Word and turn with me to the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 11. 2 Corinthians 5, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 11. And as you turn there, I, I really want to read verse 4 first, and, and then kind of work our way through the passage. It says in verse 4, for while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now that's a wonderful phrase there at the end of verse 4, to be swallowed up by life. Now it reminds me, and it probably reminds you, of, a, of another phrase or phrasing that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 15. He uses the, the, the uh, similar phrase, beginning in verse 53, 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 53, it says, For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What a, what a wonderful truth that Paul presents to, uh, the, to those who are in Christ. In verse 56, Paul tells us that the sting of death is sin. The sting of death is sin. So if death was was a wasp, its stinger would be sin, okay? 
If death was a wasp, its stinger would be sin. Death hurts you and punishes you with pain and fear. Now, when you're outside and you see a wasp or a, or a yellow jacket, what, what do you do? Well, I know what I do. I run. I don't want to be anywhere around a wasp, anywhere around a yellow jacket. Why? Because when they sting, it hurts, right? It hurts real, real bad. And so we run away in fear. Well, well, here Paul says that death has lost its stinger. It's lost its ability to incite fear in us. It's lost its stinger. stinger. And, and sin got its stinging power from the law because as human beings, we don't have the power. We don't have, we, we couldn't live the life that the law of God required. But Jesus did that for us. Jesus lived the life perfectly, and he thus fulfilled the law. So now death has lost its stinger. Sin has lost its power. So where does that leave you and me uh, for those of us who are in Christ? Well, it just leaves us victorious, right? Because death has lost its sting. Sin has lost, lost its power. We don't have to, to fear death anymore, church. Funerals for those who are in Christ they're celebrations. They're, we can celebrate life because they continue to live because Jesus lives. As children of God, death can conquer us no longer. Listen, I, I'll try to illustrate it this way, church. When I, was, when I was younger, when I was in school, I was always one of the, the smallest or the shortest kids in my class. It seemed as if I didn't grow an inch from kindergarten till my sophomore year of high school. It was almost like I stayed the same height all the way through there. I was always the shortest, always the smallest. And so when you're the smallest or you're the shortest, you're going to do one or two things. You're going to talk big. You're going to talk a good game. Or you're going to find somebody bigger than you, and you're going to befriend them. You're going to, you're going to try to, to, to make them your friend. And so... What I did was both, actually. I, I talked big. I talked a good game. My, you can ask my wife. She knew me then. I talked a really good game. And I, I'm thankful for the, the, the sanctification process, uh, right? Because, you know, and you can, I've, I've improved a little bit. You can ask my wife about that. I'm not all the way there yet. I'm not, I, haven't, I haven't arrived yet when it comes to talking. My mouth can still get me into trouble. But back then, I, I talked a good game, but I also befriended the folks, the guys in my class or the class ahead of me. I befriended them so that, uh, so that they could protect me. And why did I do that? Because on the playground, talk is cheap. It's cheap. Talk can only get you so far, but talking, just talking, will not protect you. As a matter of fact, talking... Talking without being able to back it up is just going to give you a worse beating. And, and, and you know that, and I know that. But if you have someone bigger on your side, bigger than any of the other bullies that are out there on the playground, you got nothing to fear. You got nothing to fear because you know you're going to be taken care of when anything comes up, and, and you've got, you got there the, those friends there uh, that, that are able to take up uh, for you. And so I'm thankful for those friends of mine that grew a whole lot quicker than I did because they saved me from a, from a lot of, of pain and suffering. And so church, as long as we're here on this earth, we're going to have enemies. We're going to have enemies. We, we've got the world system that, that is constantly going against uh, the, uh, a person that is, or a child of God that's trying to, to live for Christ. And so you and I, those who, who, are, who are, our aim is to please God, we're going against the grain of the world. So we're going against the, the ways of the world. Our flesh, our flesh wants nothing more than to be first and to only please itself. And yet the life of Christ, Jesus tells us to, that we have to die to ourself. We have to die to our wants. And so that runs contrary to, the, to the, one of the enemies, which is our flesh. And, the, and then we have Satan, the, the enemy who's, and his demons who are constantly trying to deceive us, to tempt us into doing something that goes against God. The Apostle Paul says one of our, our final enemies is death. He calls it our, our last enemy. 
And over in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, the Bible tells us that death is a weapon that Satan uses. He uses the weapon of death. And, and so before one comes to faith in Jesus Christ, the power of sin is not broken, and, and we are actually slaves to sin apart from Christ. And sin leads to death, and Satan knows this. He knew it then. He knows it now. And so Satan knew that God required death for us because of sin. Death had become a certainty once Adam sinned. And so Satan knew that if man re remained in the state that he was born in and continued to remain in that state until he died, he would lose all hope for being reconciled to God. And so he'd have him. So he'd use death as a, a weapon. So Satan's strategy is to deceive mankind and hold on to them until they die so that there's no longer an opportunity for them to repent and trust in Jesus Christ. So what did God do to eliminate this weapon? He sent his son. He sent his son Jesus to remove the weapon of Satan. So here's what Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So church, if you have a weapon that is better, that is greater than the enemy, then that renders the enemy's weapon useless. And that's what God has done in Jesus Christ. Satan's weapon was powerful, the, the power, power of, of death, but God has a weapon even more powerful, and that is eternal life. And this was accomplished through Jesus. He met death, he went through death, and came out on the other side. And because he lives, you and I can live. Jesus has swallowed up death by his eternal life. Now, death was a mighty foe indeed, but it was no match for the one who is life himself. You remember I said earlier, if, if when you're no match for the, for the big guys on the playground, find someone who's bigger than you and better than all the rest. Well, that's who Jesus is. He's, he's bigger and better than all the rest. He is the king, and there is no one who can come close. Now, church, we can close our Bibles this morning and, and go home and, and, and go home in the joy of the Lord. Or you're already home. You just you could just uh, just over, be overwhelmed with joy in your home. But I want us to get to our text today. And, and, and that's what we're going to do, because Paul, he longs to see the church in Corinth. And, and by and by and through that, he longs for us to to take our eyes off what we can see and put them and fix them on the things that we can't see. He says that at the end of chapter 4, that what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. So what you and I see, what we can see physically with our eyes, everything that we can see is temporary. It's temporary. That's, that's creation, that's our homes, that's our cars, that's our, our church buildings, that's even our own bodies. Paul says we can't look at these things in, or count on them or put our hope and our trust in those things. Now, those are all good things, but we can't put our trust in them. There are also some bad things that we can see, right? We, we, have, to, we have to see death. We, we see decay. We, we see job loss. We see portfolios destroyed. We see viruses. Those things sound familiar, right? Church, do you, did you realize that in one month's time, we went from having one of the all-time lowest unemployment rates to one of the all-time highest employment rates. In one month, this took place. One month. We, there's, the things that this earth cannot be counted on. There are, there are some of you out there that lost thousands of dollars, maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on how much money you had in, in retirement or in the stock market. And as it's kind of plummeted, you've, you've lost a lot of money. And so the time that we're living in right now is just like screaming, you cannot count on the things that are seen. 
you just cannot count on. They're here today, they go tomorrow, they can slip away so very quickly. And so we don't look to the things that are seen. We don't look to the things that are seen for our hope, for our courage, for our values, for our goals. We don't look to them for anything. As Christians, we look to the things that are unseen, the things that are eternal. We look to God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and we look to His Word. And that's, that's what we look to each and every week. We look to God so that we can gain the right perspective on the things down here on planet Earth. So let's walk through this passage this morning, and I hope that, that through our, our time in the Scripture together, that you'll be comforted, that you'll be encouraged, that you'll be challenged by the Word of God. So let's look at verse 1, chapter 5, and we'll read down to verse 3. The Apostle Paul, by the uh, inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal, a, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to, to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. Paul, he, he uses a metaphor there. He, he, he references and, and refers to our bodies as a, a tent, a temporary structure. And a, and a tent is good, but it's, it's just not really lasting. It's, it's, only, it's only temporary. It's much like our bodies. Uh, a, a tent can, can hold up to some things, but not everything. It can, it can be tough, but sometimes not tough enough. The, so how many of you have, have actually went camping in a, in a tent? You know, yeah, I see those hands out there. I, I have two. I've been tent camping, and I've, I've camped in a camper. And I'll tell you what, I much prefer camping in a camper. And, and maybe you are in agreement uh, with me. A tent camping is good. But being in a camper is, is better. A camper provides more shelter from the, the, the wind or the, the rain or the storms. Uh, it provides safety from, from animals or maybe thieves. But Paul refers to our bodies as tents, but he says we have a building from God. He says we got a temporary tent, but we're going to get a, a building from God, that doesn't mean we're get, we're, you and I are going to be buildings. What he's talking about is the, the uh, eternal gift of life that God is going to give us, something that cannot be taken away, something eternal, something substantial, more than just a tent that we have right now as our bodies. Now, that seems like a pretty good deal to me. I get to trade in this tent that I'm, that's kind of getting old and wrinkly. I get, to, I get to trade it in for a glorified body. And so Paul goes on, he continues on in verse 2 to describe most of us in this listening audience today. He says, verse 2, For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. In this body we groan. Can I get an amen from, from, the, from the folks in the living room this morning? In this body we groan. We, we groan. When you get past a certain age, Anything that you do out of the ordinary, you're going you're gonna to feel it. You're going to feel it. If you work out in the yard, you may struggle to get out of bed the next day. For some of you, when you go out there to crank up your car, you don't even have to steer it. It goes right to the doctor's office. It's so used to going, it's almost like autopilot. It goes there. It's, now, for those of you that are maybe 30 or under the age of 30, you know a little bit about the aches and pains, but even some of you, you've experienced toothaches or headaches or, or you maybe even have had surgeries up to this point. So you know, you've got little indications that this, this tent of yours, this body of yours is not built to last forever, but we're going to get a building from God. Paul's trying to get all these believers, and, and you and me included, all in the same boat. He's describing what, what our life is, is like. In this tent, we, we groan. He continues on in verse 4. He says, For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Paul repeats, or repeats this idea that, <laughs> that in, this, in this body, we groan. 
He, he's, again, trying to get us all in the, in the same boat, to saying, hey, that, let's, let's be honest, this body is, is temporary. I get it. Paul gets it, and, and he's going somewhere with it, and, and we're going to get to that point. But, it, but he says it's not that we want to die. It's not that we want to be unclothed, he says. We, we, don't, have a, we don't have a death wish. We're not longing to die. Uh, Paul said that he, he longed to be with Christ. He realized that was far better. We saw that last week in Philippians. But he knew that to remain here on earth meant fruitful labor for him. It meant that he, get to, he got to share more opportunities with others. He had more opportunities to tell others about Jesus. So it's, it's not that we, should, that we should long to die, but that we wouldn't fear dying. That we wouldn't fear dying. He says, don't fear death, but look to the truth that you and I will be swallowed up by life. For the Christian, when we take our final breath here on this earth, life, eternal life accomplished by Jesus Christ himself will swallow us whole. Life will swallow us 100%. There'll be nothing left out. We'll be swallowed up by life when this one ends. So we don't fear death. We don't long to die, but we don't fear death. We can face it boldly, courageously, because of what Christ has done. And Paul points to to who's responsible. Who's the responsible party for making this a reality? Verse 5, he says, He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. The responsible party for this transformation, this this overwhelming our mortality with immortality is God himself. He gets all the credit. God is preparing us for this complete transformation, taking our tent that's fading away and wasting away and replacing it with a, with a building that comes from God, something eternal. Look up at verse 17 of chapter 4. Paul says, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Paul uses the same Greek word for prepare in verse 17 as he does for verse 5 to point to the truth that God himself is the one who will overwhelm our mortality. Because here's the issue, and, and, and you kind of, in Paul's letters, you kind of have to sometimes dig a little bit to find out what the issue is for that particular church and what the, what the particular issue for the Corinthians, they were failing to see the invisible work of God that is conforming them into the image of Jesus Christ. They were failing to see how God was working in their lives. And sometimes, Christian, sometimes God uses suffering to bring about something good in us, to, to round off those, those hard edges in our life. And so Paul tells the church in, in Corinth, in chapter 4, verse 17, this light momentary, this temporary affliction, this temporary suffering is doing something in us. You may not see it. You're relying too much on what you see physically. You're not seeing what, what the things that matter, the unseen, the work of the Holy Spirit of God. They're just focusing on the, the wasting away of, of their bodies and how they're groaning and how it's, life is hard for them currently. They're failing to see how God is working inwardly through and by His Spirit that indwells every believer. And you and I, we know how, how easy it is to focus on the here and now, to focus on what we see. And when we do that, church, we get discouraged. We, we, we start to give up hope. We start to, uh, our, our, our earnest desire to please God starts to, to wane a little bit. But Paul points him to the Spirit, the one who can't be seen, but his work in a person's life is clearly seen. And, and he gave, gave, gave us a truly great display of the Spirit's work over in chapter 4, if you want to flip over there, and it may be, you may be on the same page as I am. Chapter 4, verse 7, down to verse 9. Paul says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, 
but not destroyed. Great verses, and some of you probably have those memorized. Church, let me try to illustrate what what Paul is is putting forth there. Have you ever seen those those what the, I call them cow ants? I don't know if that's the actually the the right word. I call them cow ants, or they may be called velvet ants. I'm not really sure. But you know the ones I'm talking about, the little giant ants that you that you see uh, around and in, in, uh, during the summer and all. Those cow ants. If you, if you tried to step on them or smash them or crush them or even light them on fire, uh, those little cow ants just keep on trucking, man. They just keep on trucking. Wherever they're headed, I don't know where they're headed, but the, you, you just, they're almost unstoppable. They just keep on trucking. They keep crawling. It's like nothing can keep them from where they're going. Well, Paul explains in verses 7 through 9 that, that we're kind of like cow ants in that way. We're kind of like cow ants. We're afflicted. We're not crushed. We're perplexed at times, but we're not driven to despair. Persecuted, but we know we're never alone. We're struck down, but we are not destroyed. We just keep on trucking. And all of this happens to us in this life. And yet the reason why we can keep on keeping on is the power of the work of the Spirit of God in us. In Within these jars of clay, as, as Paul uses another metaphor to describe our bodies. The Spirit of God is transforming us from one degree of glory to another until one day God will transform our lowly body and give us a heavenly body. And Paul says in verse 5 that the Spirit of God is just a taste of what is to come, a down payment by God so that we can be sure that heaven is ours. You say, you may ask, well, how do you know if you have the Spirit of God? One of the great, great truths of that is that you treasure Christ that you treasure Christ, that you long to please Him, you love His Word, you long to obey it, you no longer see the cross as foolishness, you see the cross as wonderful. You are a more loving person, a more joyful person. You have peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. It means that Christ holds the same place in your life as he does in the universe. It means that you may not be what you long to be yet, but you're not who you used to be. That's the work of the Spirit in the life of every believer. And look where it leads. Look at verse 6 down to verse 9. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. Paul acknowledges and and, and puts before the the church at at Corinth, the Christians there, the believers there, that the Spirit is a guarantee. He is a guarantee given by God that there is more to come, that the best is yet to come, and And even though, Paul points out, even though we know it is true that to be here on earth is to be away from the presence of the Lord, we can still have courage knowing that eternal life is certain because God has made it known by putting His Spirit within us. We have courage because God has paid the down payment of what is to come, and He cannot rescind it. He is the one who came up with a payment process, the life of his son for the sins of mankind. So if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and in him alone, God cannot take that back. That is the way he has designed it. You are in the family of God and eternal life belongs to you. And so if we simply focused on the wasting away of of our bodies, we would be discouraged because... (laughs) Some, some mornings I look in the mirror and I'm discouraged. It's like, what happened? You've gotten old on me. It happens. But we walk by faith, not by sight. We don't focus on the things that are around us, the things that are temporary, the things that we see. And so Paul's end of the matter in verses 6 through 9 is this, whether we are here on earth or with Jesus, our aim, our goal of life is to please him. That's the goal of Christian life is to please our Savior, our Lord. Now, 
a, a Muslim, he looks forward to dying so that he can get 72 two virgins. A, a Mormon wants to die so that he can create his, his own universe. Yet a Christian, a Christian knows that death will give way to the one thing that we have longed for since the day we got saved, to be in the physical presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we long for. And we are promised by God himself through his word. That's exactly what we'll get in Christ Jesus. We will be with him forever. Church, the truth of heaven affects how life is lived down here. And the truth that we get from Scripture is, is courage. Paul says it twice. We are always of good courage. Verse 6, verse 8, yes, we are of good courage. And, and courage, biblical courage, means that the knowledge of what will be pervades the knowledge of what is. The knowledge of what will be supersedes and overcomes the knowledge of what is. That is true biblical courage, and that's what the truth of God gives you and me. It gives us that courage to live the Christian life. We make it our aim to please God, which, which leads quite smoothly to verse 10 as Paul continues, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Church Christians, you and I will stand before God. Now, we won't stand before God uh, as judgment for, before our sins. Jesus has already taken care of that. But we will stand before God and give an account of what we've done, deeds done in the body, since we have trusted Christ. Whether, whether good or bad, or good or light, as that Greek word means there for, for evil. Meaning, did you live for the weightiness of, of God's glory or for the, the, the lightness of your own pleasure? Did you live for the things that mattered, the things that mattered to God, or did you just kind of live for, for things that didn't really matter? In, in church, you know that, and, and, and you know that that's, that can sometimes, that good and the, the heavy weight things, the things that are good and the things that are light, sometimes that, that bleeds into the church. Sometimes a church can, can be too much country clubbish, if you will, focusing on the things that don't really matter. Are they fun? Yeah. Are they, are they, are they you know, do we have a good time? Are we entertained? Yeah, and those things, they have their place. But the, what we are to do as a church, we're focused on the, the way of things. We're equipped the saints to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to see lost people come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, to teach and preach the Word of God. The weighty things that matter. Do you live for those things? Did you live? We'll, we'll stand before God. We'll give an account before God. There's a story of a seminary professor. He had all of his, his students sit down in the classroom and said, take out a sheet of paper and a pen. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write down the goals for your life. And so he, he let them, gave them time to do that. And then he said, okay, here's what I want you to do. Flip that paper over. And he said, let's say you only have 18 months to live. Now write down your goals. And he said, if, if the back doesn't match the front, then you're not actually pursuing the things that matter. You're not living for the right things. It makes a difference. When, when we know our time is short, it narrows our focus, doesn't it? It narrows our focus. Church, whether you live to be 80 or 90 or even 100, this life is fleeting. We are a vapor. We are here today. We are gone tomorrow. Live for the things that matter. A.W. Tozer, he said, we are left for a season among men. Let us faithfully represent him here just so very briefly we are here and we will give an account for what we've done in the body verse 11 and we'll close therefore knowing the fear of the lord we persuade others 
knowing this, knowing this, that we will stand before God, knowing this truth, we persuade others. We persuade men. Everyone, not just Christians, everyone will stand before God one day. For us as Christians, again, we will be judged for what we have done since our salvation and we'll be rewarded accordingly. But the unbeliever will stand before God and will be judged for his sin and be separated from God for all of eternity. That's real and that's the truth. That's why we persuade men and women and boys and girls to be reconciled to God, to repent and trust in Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, that's what Paul talks about in the rest of chapter 5. That you and I, as Christians, we're to be ambassadors for Christ, telling men and women, boys and girls, anyone that will hear, that they can be reconciled to God. That they can be reconciled to God. That they, too, can be swallowed up by life. That's what you and I are called to do, to persuade others with this truth. Church, Jesus died. He was buried. And he rose again. He rose again. He has removed the, the punishment for sin. He has conquered death. And he's coming one day to make all things new. And you and I can be victorious in this life and in the next one because of Jesus Christ. And so the truth I want you to leave here with today, the truth that I want you to, to just take with you, being swallowed up by life means we can face anything in this one. Being swallowed up by life means we can face anything in this one in this life. And because, because we can be swallowed up by life, we share this truth with others. Because others, there are others that need to hear this truth, that they can be swallowed up by life, that this life is not all there is. Because he lives, we will live. Because he lives, we can live right now. And so for those of you, for those of you who have yet to trust Christ, I would plead with you today to embrace this truth. That God loves you. That Jesus died on the cross for payment for your sin. For he, he is your substitute. But he didn't stay dead. He died on the cross, but he didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave. That's why we celebrate Easter. That's why we celebrate the resurrection, both today and every day, that Jesus lives. So if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved based on the authority of God's word. And for you, Christian, we are reminded by the truth of God's word that we can face anything. We can face anything in, the, in this life. We can face the challenge that, is, that we are living in that is before us right now. We can face it because he lives. We can face anything in this life because one day we'll be swallowed up by life. And because we can be swallowed up by life, we share this truth with others to let other folks know that there is a life, the life of Christ, and we can be swallowed up by this life. Church, aren't you glad there's such a thing called the resurrection? Aren't you glad that there's such a thing called eternal life? That there is such a thing as eternal life. And it's provided for us through Jesus Christ. Now, I want to I close today with the lyrics from, from one of my favorite hymns. Hymn number 407 in the Baptist hymnal. You probably already know what the song I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read to you today. It's because he lives. And here are the lyrics. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. 
How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still the calm assurance this child can face in certain days because he lives. And then one day I'll cross the river. I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds a future and life is worth living just because he lives. Church, one day we'll be swallowed up by life. We'll trade in our tent for an eternal body, resurrected body. It'll, it'll be glorious. We can, we can be joyful today because he lives, church. Let's pray together. Father, God, it's been great to be in your word this morning and be reminded of your truth. Father, as we navigate through this time that we're all living in, Lord, it is good to know that this isn't all there is, that there is something far greater than what we have here. Father, help us to look to the things that are unseen and not to the things that are seen. May we continue to, to hope to hope in you, to find our courage in you, to find our goals in you, to find our values in you, to find our purpose in you. Lord, may we make it our life's aim to please you, knowing for certain that we can face anything and everything because you live, that we'll one day, one glorious day, be swallowed up by life. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.